Welcome to St. John's Church. Delighted to have you in worship with us today. We begin with our acclamation. I will make you as a light for the nations, that, that my salvation, salvation may reach to the end of the, of the earth. earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have, have mercy, mercy upon, upon us. Together we say, glory to God, God in the highest <coughs> and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, God heavenly King, King, almighty God, God and Father, Father, we worship you, we, we give, give you thanks, thanks we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated on the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. Amen. O God, you know that we are set in the midst of many grave dangers. Because of the frailty of our nature, we cannot always stand upright. Grant that your strength and protection may support us in all dangers and carry us through every temptation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Reading from Deuteronomy. <clears throat> the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading of Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory Glory to to you, Lord Lord Christ. Christ. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere and throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to to you, you, Lord Christ. Christ. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would be among us now, that you would speak, that you would remove from us any Uh, dangers or fears, that you would be exalted and that we would be drawn to you as you're lifted up. I pray in your name. Amen. Well, good morning again, friends. Good to be with you. We turn our attention to Mark's lesson this morning, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. This is the first public event that Mark records in the life of Jesus. He's been baptized He's gathered a disciple or two, but as of yet, Mark has given us no indication as to who this Jesus is or what he's going to be about. And this is where it all begins. What is this beginning to this ministry? What are his disciples' first window into the character of their new rabbi? Well, it's a sermon given in a synagogue, interrupted by an exorcism. It's quite a way to start. And this is what Mark, the gospel writer, thinks we need to see right off the bat. This is where we need to start. Here we will see something about Jesus that is apparently central to our understanding of him. Central to who he will be revealed to be. So what is it? What's this thing that Mark would have us see right off the bat? Well, it's the same thing that the congregation there in the synagogue sees. Let's look at it together. Verse 21, and they, Jesus and his disciples, went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. That is what a synagogue is for. It's a place of teaching, of teaching on the Hebrew scriptures, on the law of Moses. If you wanted to go to the center of worship to make a proper sacrifice as an Israelite, you'd go to the temple. But if you lived too far away to make that trek, synagogues were where local gatherings would occur to observe Sabbath, to pray, to be taught from the Scriptures. Actually, the first half of our worship service on Sunday morning is based off of the synagogue service model, gathering to read and be taught and to pray. So it's not unusual at all for a rabbi to step into a synagogue and begin to teach. But there's something unusual about this one, about this rabbi in this synagogue. Verse 22 They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. He taught as one who had authority. Authority. Jesus teaches with authority. There's power in what he says. There's moral weight behind what he's saying. Not like the scribes, the Bible scholars of his day, those who would quote their sources and make their neat Tidy arguments. Well, looking, at the rab- looking at the law, old Rabbi Gamaliel said this, old Rabbi Hillel said this. We should probably think about it like this then. That doesn't seem to be how Jesus approaches the Scriptures we see elsewhere in the Gospels. When Jesus stands up and speaks, he speaks as one with authority. He doesn't need to quote sources to defend his opinions. He speaks as though he knows what the Hebrew Scriptures meant. He doesn't need help interpreting them. He speaks 
with authority. And this is the first thing that Mark would have us see. The first step in Jesus' ministry. First step in his long journey to the cross and resurrection. Jesus demonstrates a unique authority, particularly over the scriptures. And people marvel. They're amazed as he teaches. And not necessarily amazed in a good way. Disconcerted, shocked, amazed, staggered. They're not really sure what to do about this guy. Who is this teacher who thinks so much about what he has to say? Who does he think he is? Could what he teaches be true? And what does he teach after all? Well, Mark doesn't tell us here. Mark has a habit of not telling us what Jesus says in a given moment. But we already know from earlier in the chapter that Jesus is going around teaching that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the power of God, the creator, is inbreaking into his world, is restoring the peace for which God created it. Jesus is declaring in the news of the kingdom that God himself is present to undo the works of sin and death and even evil itself. And it wouldn't be surprising if this was the teaching that provoked what happens next. In verse 23, immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. An unclean spirit. This is a demon, an evil spiritual presence. Now we have to pause there right away, don't we? Because in the modern West, we have a problem believing in spirits at all, much less in unclean evil ones. Now they conjure up images of Salem witch trials or pop culture horror movies. When we step back and think about them, we tend to see ideas of this, of evil spiritual presences as primitive, uneducated, superstitious. It's an interesting premise for a piece of fiction, for a piece of entertainment, maybe, but there's no real bearing on the real world. And of course, that sense of a material world without any spiritual dimension is a modern Assumption, it's influenced by a couple centuries of European philosophy. It's an assumption not shared by most human beings in most of the world through most of history. The vast majority of humans have always thought it much more likely that there are, in fact, spiritual presences within this world, both good and evil. Personalities present and active to us that don't fit in the neat categories we have drawn for the things we can see and touch. Most of the world has always believed that, and as Lewis argues, it would be quite the coup if evil could somehow convince the world that it did not exist. It would be be quite happy to be ignored. That's where we find ourselves in the West, disbelieving, unexpecting that any such spiritual beings could be at work. And yet, if you're thoughtful, we do have moments where we question that assumption of no spiritual presence, don't we? We have good moments and bad moments that bring into question whether or not these spirits might actually be present, might exist moments of darkness and of joy that confuse us, that we set aside Scripture, anyway, it leaves no doubt. There is a spiritual dimension to creation and spiritual personalities at work in ways that can affect us. And so here we have one. Here we have an unclean spirit bound somehow to a man here in the synagogue. And as Jesus speaks of the inbreaking kingdom of God, it reacts against it. Again, in verse 23, he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus proclaims with authority that the kingdom of God is at hand and evil reacts against that proclamation. Why? Well, because the kingdom that is now at hand is not their kingdom. The kingdom of God threatens to undermine whatever authority, whatever power, whatever kingdom they claim to have. Have you come to destroy us? The spirit asks. He knows the answer. 
spirits know that the coming kingdom spells their doom. And notice, this evil spirit recognizes Jesus for who he is far before anyone else does in the Gospel of Mark. Evil is much quicker to acknowledge God's presence than we often are. I know who you are, says the Holy One of God. A bit of cultural background here. In the ancient world, exorcism was often tied to knowing the name of the spirit at hand. If you could name whatever that spiritual being was, uh, whatever, if you could name whatever spiritual being was present, you would thereby gain some kind of control over them. It may well be that this spirit reacting to the word of the kingdom come is in fact bowing up for battle with Jesus, declaring Jesus' name. I see you. I know you. He's preparing for the conflict that seems imminent, but then right then, in the dead center of this episode, Jesus interrupts him, rebukes him, in verse 25, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And of course, it does. Convulsing him, crying out with a loud voice, the Spirit came out of him. The Spirit reacts, it bows up, prepares for battle, and Jesus speaks five words in Greek, and it's over. Five words. There's no formula, no naming of the Spirit, no holy oil, no crucifixes, no magic words, no battle. He says, in essence, shut up and get out. That's it. And it's over. Authority. Authority. This is the authority that again Jesus displays. And the crowds again are stunned. Again, they're amazed. And again, not necessarily with positive amazement. Even after proving his authority to teach by exercising authority over evil, the crowds are still unsettled, disconcerted. Power, you see, is destabilizing, even if it's good. It's disorienting, even if it's offering a corrective to evil. The status quo cannot remain when authority like this walks into the room. When authority like this is present, evident, active. And Mark leaves us here. He leaves us with some questions. He leaves us wondering, where can such authority come from? I mean, who has authority to teach about the kingdom like they really know what it's about? Who has the authority, who has the power to remove the warring enemies of the kingdom with a word, without a battle? Who bears such authority in this fallen creation? Who bears the authority of the kingdom? Could it be the king? And so Mark leaves us here. Whoever Jesus is, he bears authority unlike anyone else. He speaks of the kingdom authoritatively, as though he knows it personally, as though it is his own. He speaks to evil as one authority, even over it, as one who dominates, even destroys it without effort. Who is this Jesus? A couple applications I want to leave you with. This morning. The first is if Jesus speaks with this kind of authority, we should listen to him. Listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. And of all the many voices crying out for our ears, crying for us to give heed to what they're saying, there is one who has authority to merit our listening. Listen to him. Not only that, trust him. Trust him. There's no power, however evil, however cruel, which can touch him. No authority that can rival him. You know, sometimes we think that because evil is horrible, it is therefore strong. But it is not strong. Not compared to Jesus. 
There's no competition here. There's no battle. Jesus speaks, and it's over before it begins. Sometimes in our, in our uh, culture today, we speak of evil as the equal opposite to good, yin-yang, balance in the force kind of thing. This is not what we discover in Jesus. Instead, we find a king and a kingdom that has ultimate authority, even over those rebels which desire its collapse. Friends, when we are faced with evil, with powers beyond our control, we do not need spells or strategies or rituals. We have Jesus, and we have his kingdom, and his power, and his glory, because we are his. We need not be afraid. Trust in him and his authority. And finally, if this is true, if Jesus speaks with this authority, if he handles evil with this authority, then a true response to it, to his authority, is ourselves to be disconcerted and amazed. Because the status quo cannot remain if he is who he says he is. If this authority is true and valid, what would it mean for us? What would it mean if the king of the kingdom came and spoke? What would it do to the status quo of this world, of this community, this church? What would it do to the status quo of our hearts? A right understanding of the authority of Christ is disconcerting, even as it's good. This is the authority that he brings, an authority that invites us to listen, to trust, and to be disconcerted. That's an invitation. Amen. Now let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the, the Father, the, the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all, all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Now let us pray for the church and for the world. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Chip Edgar, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, including Bishop Lawrence, our Bishop Emeritus. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, 
Lord, in your mercy, you hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially President Biden, Governor McMaster, and Mayor Myers Irvin, we pray for all those who go into harm's way for us, especially Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Kopp, James Garvey, Matt Harvey, Brandon Johnson, Daniel Lamb, Andrew McCarrier, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Tom Miller, Mike Shaw, Michael Sims, John Taft, Ben Thornton, Stephen Turner, and Ricky Tyner and their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Ruby Lynn Barnes, Kathy Callahan, Teresa Carter, Mary Chapman, Jill Clemens, B.C. Correll, Aubrey Crawford, Richard B. Elderfeld, Lynn Gilbert, Harry Greenleaf, Jason Hamshaw, Nancy Hope, Sue Hopewell, Andrea Kelly, Luana Miller, Tom Miller, Shot Paget, Kay Paris, Amelia Smith, Rhett Tal Talavast, Marley Thompson, Gene Waters, Paige Williams, and Millie Yarborough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, especially Hope Dabney. In thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. It's peace. peace. Well, God's peace to all of you as well. Delighted to have you in worship with us today. Uh, as you join us online, I invite you as always to come and join us in person as you were able to do. Uh, we have worship services here every Sunday. 9 a.m. is outside. If it's cold or if the weather is bad enough, driving rain or something like that, um, then we will move from the pavilion. And we're trying out being in the church this winter. 
um, if we have to move inside. So we're praying that the weather is good enough in the mornings that we can stay outside, have the fire going and the heaters on and be comfortable enough. But be on the lookout if it is particularly cold weather and you're looking to join us at 9 a.m. Uh, and look for notices of if we are moving inside uh, here inside the church. And then, of course, 11 a.m., we have worship here in the church as well. So I invite you to be a part of that as you're able to do so. Um, we're excited about a few things that are coming up. Uh, our Oyster Roast is on February 9th. Uh, we have sold a lot of tickets to that. We are close to, if not sold out already at this point. Um, so if you are interested in buying tickets, do go ahead and reach out to the office uh, and make sure that you can get some. We are delighted to have such a good response. It's always a good time. We hope that you can join us on February 9th. Uh, we'll be in the back here on our campus. Uh, come out and eat some oysters and uh, have some Brunswick stew and just enjoy getting to know some other members of St. John's and the greater community who've come out to be a part of that. Also coming up on February 13th, uh, it is Shrove Tuesday. Um, the last day before Lent begins with Ash Wednesday. And so we're going to have, as is our tradition, our pancake supper. Our um, students in our youth ministry will be cooking the pancakes for us. Uh, we'll have a delicious pancake meal. And then, as we did last year, uh, we are going to be taking the palms from Palm Sunday of this previous year. We're going to take those palms and burning them together uh, in a fire pit in order to create the ashes, which will be used in the service the following day. Uh, so it is a neat way. We'll have a little bit of a teaching just to explain what's going on and the symbolism behind it. But hope you can join us for that. Uh, I believe we are going to start serving around, typically it's around 5.30. Uh, we'll start serving pancakes, and we try to wrap up around 7. So uh, that is the itinerary for uh, Shrove Tuesday on February 13th, and then on February 14th, Valentine's Day, just so you know, it's also Ash Wednesday. So we'll have two services on Ash Wednesday, one at noon, which will take place out in the pavilion, it'll be outside, and then a 6 p.m. service here in the church uh, as we observe Ash Wednesday. Later in the month, um, the week following, actually, we will begin our Lenten teaching series. We're very excited about this series this year. We're going to be looking at the short stories of George MacDonald. If that's not a name you're familiar with, uh, then some of his protégés are, are, are writers who looked up to him and were influenced by him um, might be names that are familiar to you. He has a long list of uh, writers that he has influenced, including C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, many, many others as well. And so we're going to be looking at his short stories, and we've invited a great lineup of speakers to come and present on different short stories of George MacDonald. Uh, so we're excited to have that beginning. That's going to be on Thursdays, uh, and we will have, um, first up will be uh, John Bryant. John Bryant is a speaker who came to us last year. Uh, he's a street pastor, and he's also recently published a book on uh, his um, experiences with mental health and how that affects his understanding of Christ and the gospel and how Jesus meets us even um, when we are facing these sorts of difficulties. So we've also invited him on February 20th. We're excited to partner with Helping Florence Flourish, and from 7 to 9 p.m., we're going to have John Bryant come and present to us on his book, a Quiet Mind to Suffer With, uh, that has been um, called by Christianity Today one of their best books of this past year. And so uh, that will be on uh, February 20th from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, there is a registration that will be available for that, so please do let us know if you want to join us for that. Believe it or not, that is just about one month's worth of activities. It seems like more than that, but we are excited to have so many different things, ways that you can Join in and be a part of what we're doing here at St. John's. As always, feel free to call the church office. If you need more information or if you need to contact a member of our staff directly, we look forward to opportunity to speak with you and get to know you better. We have some birthdays and some anniversaries to celebrate. So a happy birthday to June Cochran, Coleman Buckhouse, Mary Sue Bruton, Stacy Johnson, uh, Corey Prescott. That would be this Corey Prescott, not my wife. Uh, and my daughter, Grace Prescott, we share a birthday. Miles McCann, Andrew Grantham, and Cortland Evans are all celebrating birthdays. And happy anniversary to Josie and Alan Wood, 
B and Bruce King and Marsha and Dick Bryant as well. So happy anniversary to you all. Happy birthday to you all. We hope that you enjoy your special day. We turn now to conclude our service in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.